People were putting up flyers around my neighborhood calling me a bigot, things like that. People were burning sacks of the paper and sending me video of it. Surprising to me was that my old friends, the people I'd been friends with for 10, in some cases 15, almost 20 years, those people also, a lot of them, um, kind of kicked me out. Hey everybody, I'm Brad Palumbo, and welcome back to the Damage Control Podcast, where we're reclaiming the debate over LGBT issues from the crazy people who've taken it over. My guest today is journalist Katie Herzog, a liberal-minded lesbian and co-host of the podcast Locked and Reported. In recent years, Katie has found herself vilified and ostracized by the LGBT community for her nuanced and dissident takes on transgender issues, free speech, and more. We're going to walk through her origin story, what she makes of all the different issues in the modern LGBT community, and so much more. But first, if you're new here, please do consider subscribing to the show and sticking around, and don't forget to like and comment if you're watching us on YouTube. Now, let's get to our conversation with Katie. Katie Herzog, thanks so much for coming on the podcast. Thanks so much for having me, Brad. I guess this is payback. Yeah, yeah. So I co-hosted uh, your show, Blocked and Reported, recently, and that was a lot of fun. I got a lot of positive feedback uh, from people discovering my show, apparently, from that. So hopefully that'll work out. But um, I will. Ha- I do have to tell you, I was looking you up, doing research, looking for dirt about your background. And I searched your name on Wikipedia, and you'll be delighted to know that the only mention of you that came up was a tangential mention on the page for Jesse Single. Yes, I'm absolutely delighted to be a footnote in my uh, my sidekicks <laughs> page. I did at one point have a Wikipedia page, and then if you, I went and I read the like the comment. There was a, a a fight among editors about whether or not I was notable enough to have a Wikipedia page, and apparently uh, the answer is no. <laughs> That's funny. I didn't realize that uh, that that it was that intense. But yeah. since there's no Wikipedia to consult, can you give listeners maybe just a, a short version of the Katie Herzog origin story or villain arc, depending <laughs> how you view it? Well, for your listeners, I don't know. It could be it could be either one. Uh, yeah. So I'm a journalist, podcaster. Before I started this show, I was a reporter at The Stranger, which is Seattle's All Weekly. And uh, that was that's probably the beginning of my my origin story as a villain. Um, before that, I worked at an outlet called Grist, which is like climate change news. And before that, I was in public radio. Um, so I have maybe taken a bit of an arc from from basically regular old libtard um, to whatever I am now. Yeah, and and what's really interesting uh, is at the stranger. It, I've never read it. I'm not from the area, so I've read it online, obviously, but. It, it gives the vibe of like this edgy, dissident place. But then when you started to be even slightly edgy or slightly is- dissident, it didn't go great for you, did it? I mean, did it change during your time there? Not really. So The Stranger was founded by a guy named Tim Keck, who is actually the founder of The Onion. So he himself is very iconoclastic. He, he's, I wouldn't call him edgy. He's now like a man in his 60s, but very funny guy. Um, he also, he sold the onion. He's probably the worst businessman in history because he sold the onion to his own employees for $10,000. Um, and then he moved out to, yeah. Oh, no. Yeah. Then he moved out to Seattle with people like Dan Savage to start this people. They were all living in uh, the Midwest at the time. And so it, the stranger, by the time I got there, it had really seen better days like most alt weeklies. Not, but not just in terms of the uh, the size of the paper. You know, it went from being this like gargantuan weekly thing to when when I was there, it was biweekly, much thinner than a, than it had been. You know, ten years before or whatever, uh, twenty years before. But it wasn't just the 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 sort of economic situation that had changed. What also changed was the cultural situation. So, like here's here's an example. The stranger after. It was either George, I think it was after George Bush won a uh, one maybe against John Kerry or maybe, I think, yeah, against John Kerry. The stranger had the cover of the paper was, I might be getting the details wrong, but the, the basics are correct. The cover of the paper was in an image of a man, a bunch of people at a bar looking like very depressed and a man's legs hanging from, like he had clearly in this image, like hung himself and there was a pea stain at his crotch, right? So that was the sort of like art that you could see accompanying a an article about about an election night at the stranger. So by the time I got there in 2017, if you put like a reference to like if you put like a, 
you know, a gun to head emoji in Slack, there would be complaints about staff members being triggered because they had felt suicidal ideation in the past. So that was the kind of that was the kind of cultural shift um, over the past, you know, 30 years of the paper's existence. And I didn't really fit into the <laughs> to the new uh, to the new ethos of the of the paper. Um, so yeah, it was not a not a particularly fun place for me to be. So we're going to talk about your infamous detransitioner article, but but prior to that, were there any other stories? Like that's the one that blew up and went viral. But were there any that things you reported on that didn't go over well with your colleagues or any any tensions before that? So that was maybe my second or third piece for the stranger at all. I was a freelancer when I filed that piece. So I have no, I, I written a piece, a piece on like I microdosed mushrooms for a month, that sort of thing you could do easily at the paper and there would be no complaints. I did a thing about like the dangers of virtual reality. You know, that sort of stuff was very much within, um, within the paper's ethos. It was really the detransitioner piece that I think put me on this um, separate path. And the thing is, I, it's not as though I didn't know it was going to be controversial, but I didn't know it was going to be so controversial within the pages of the paper. Um, so just for people who are familiar with the piece, this was in 2017 and it was an article, it was a profile of about six different detransitioners. So people who had transitioned from one sex to another and, or gender and essentially changed their mind. Um, this was at a time when most people probably didn't know the word detransitioner and the piece was, it was very careful. I thought it was very sensitive. I took the utmost care to sort of show that the you know the real bad guys are like the right wingers trying to make trying to make trans people use the wrong bathroom and stuff like that. And there are a lot of things about the piece that I would that I would have done differently if I wrote it today, obviously. But there was this real outcry online and in Seattle, people were putting up flyers around my neighborhood, calling me a bigot, things like that. People were burning sacks of the paper and sending me video of it. And because I was a freelancer, the stranger, I also wasn't really aware, and I didn't have friends there I wasn't really aware of what was going on inside the paper and it turned out that this caused this massive sort of shitstorm within the paper um like for instance there was a, a staff writer there who had read the read a draft of the story and offered some notes and they were very uh you know move this paragraph up don't forget to like very just non-important notes nothing was like this is this is the work of a hardened bigot nothing like don't publish this nothing like that so she had some she had nice things to say about it just sort of stylistic changes that she would that she would make and then i found out later that after the piece came up and there was this huge blow up online she apparently threatened to quit so that was the sort of social pressure that was going on and i was totally naive to this I had no idea nobody was like sitting me down and telling me what was going on I heard things and drips and drabs later uh, so I really walked in sort of already being the sort of odd man out without even being aware of it it took me it so, took me a while to figure out like oh these people don't fuck like me yeah so I, I actually went back and read it in anticipation of you coming on the show and I don't think I'd ever read it before I've, I've heard it discussed at great lengths uh, but 2017, I don't think I was following you yet or whatever. So I've never actually read it. And I'm struck by how anodyne it is in terms of Very its much. coverage of detransitioners and also how generous and and positive it is towards the dominant view from the transgender community. And so mm -hmm. it's really, it's not surprising to me because in my life, I've operated in several similarly skewed echo chambers and bubbles but it still like nonetheless strikes me as deeply absurd the way they freaked out over this in a way that suggested to me many of them hadn't read it or were reading oh, yeah. it in really bad faith. A lot of them hadn't read it. I think that's what it came down to. And, you know, I thought I was naive at that point. I thought the fact that I'm gay and that I had lots of trans friends, I, this this was true. I lived in in. in communities where there were lots of trans people around particularly trans men and this was just not i i thought that that sort of would protect me but it obviously <laughs> did, not. It did not and if anything made things worse so uh, so, yeah, so do like, i have the the chron the chronology correct here that you wrote this controversial article as a freelancer and then joined the stranger as a staffer 
Yeah. So I got really lucky in that even though my like my immediate colleagues thought that I was a hardened bigot because of this very anodyne piece, um, the people who ran the paper, I think, were impressed by not just the quality of the work, but also that I was um, willing to take this on and that probably mostly that I refused to apologize. Uh, I think they probably expected expected me to sort of like roll over and show my belly and be like, oh, I'm sorry, I sh-, you know, like like take it off the Internet or whatever. And I didn't. I was basically like, I didn't do anything wrong. I'm not going to apologize for, I didn't do anything wrong. I'm not doing this. Um, And they offered me a job. Um, So I got very lucky. So it was really the outcry over the article. I think as much as the article itself that really changed my career and changed my life in many ways. So I should um, thank everyone. I should thank everyone who freaked out about it because um, they are, (laughs) they are the reason I am here today. Yeah, it's kind of funny. In your Google results, a New York Times article comes up that the headline is something like, all the people we tried to cancel, they're all hanging out. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, that was a a little bit. uh, I'm not hanging out with Dave Rubin. Let's just put it that way. Uh, Okay, yeah. Uh, maybe especially not these days um Mm -hmm. but so how did i know you eventually parted ways with the stranger during like pandemic furlough did you run into any more tensions there with other stories Mm -hmm. you reported or did you just naturally part ways no there was a lot of tension um during me too so i got there in 2017 so i was there at the beginning of me too and my impulse was not to like write up every allegation as though it was automatically true and to like go hunting for stories about non-famous people who've done something wrong at their office my impulse was to like pause and say like wait a second believe women wait do you know any women like you obviously don't date them if you think we should just believe women um (laughs) and so i you know I, i wrote about i wrote some me too stories that i think upset people um during the Blasey Ford, uh, the Brett Kavanaugh story when uh, during the Senate confirmation hearings, uh, I wrote a piece about memory and a piece about how like it's possible to believe both of them, which is in fact what I do believe. I believe that they both believe. I believe that she believes that she was assaulted and I believe that he believes that he did not assault her. Um, hard to know what's actually true in that case. So I just, I, I tried to inject some nuance into these culture war stories and it made me um extremely unpopular among sort of like queer seattle and my colleagues and you know what it kind of came down to i I think was age a lot like basically everybody over the age of 35 thought that i was fine and everybody under the age of 35 thought that i was literal hitler um so things like i wrote things all the time that piece people off there was a guy Someone was wearing a MAGA hat in Capitol Hill, which was the neighborhood in Seattle where the office was, and he got assaulted. And I wrote a piece about why that's bad. Like, don't assault teenagers with MAGA hats. You know, just things like that, which to me just seem like this is obvious. Like, not even just from, like, a moral perspective, but also it's not good politics to assault people for wearing a hat that you don't like. I was there during the um, – during the – um Covington Catholic thing I'm sure I wrote something about that oh Jesse Smollett after (laughs) Jesse Smollett was not attacked this was uh extremely obvious to me that this was fake from about 30 seconds after hearing the story and I wrote it always sounded way too much like um a fantasy like a kink like a fetish (laughs) <laughs> exactly and except for the subway also like what celebrity eats subway um and so after after that I wrote a piece not even saying I don't believe that this happened just saying like wait a, let's just wait let's just wait and like see what the reports say and my editor at the time refused to publish it that was one of maybe two times that something I wrote was just like we're not going to publish this I was right obviously they of course they did publish other people saying like oh my god America is so racist and this proves it um, but they did not publish my very, very sensible take to just like pause when something seems unbelievable. It might. Yeah, that's really interesting. And so then it, you kind of took COVID as an off ramp or do, do you anticipate that if you hadn't had that kind of off ramp, what was it? A, def, a deferment or? An... Uh, I, I was furloughed. So what happened furloughed. is that Seattle was, you know, sort of on the first wave of cities to shut down because the first 
COVID case in the US documented case was in Seattle. And also just, I think politically, Seattle in particular, Washington since state, but P Seattle in particular is the sort of place where like, we're gonna like follow the science, no matter what the science actually is, but we're going to sort of on the, like do service, like be very, very, very- COVID In Fauci, we trust. <laughs> Absolutely. There's actually, I'm not kidding. There is a house on uh, on the interstate when you're leaving Seattle, and it had like this house has like s this giant sign outside that said something like "Science is God." Something, <laughs> something, something absolutely, absolutely ridiculous. But I, that's sort of the attitude that people have there. It's very much believe science is a religion, except for that science is inconvenient. Anyway, so Seattle shut down really early, and the paper obviously like ran on ads for events and restaurants and things like that. And so the paper very quickly, um, it was clear that it was going to be in like real financial distress. I went to my boss and I thought a vacation sounds like a great idea, especially while the world is ending. So I offered to take a furlough, not really thinking that he would take me up on it. And he was like, yes, thank you. Um, so I took a furlough from the paper and then really quickly after that, everybody, almost everybody, I think they kept a, a small handful of staffers. Um, everybody ended up getting laid off, um, including me. So it was a meant to be sort of a temporary thing that turned into a, um, a full layoff, which I w was thrilled about, frankly. It doesn't sound like your long-term future there would have worked out. Uh, yeah, I mean, I would have stayed probably forever because of just the the media environment and like where else am i going to get a job you know and i'd always i'd always wanted to work there and so it was this sort of like dream come true job except for the reality is of course very much very different than uh, the dream the daydream and i also just you know i'm i'm fairly cautious especially when it comes to professional stuff like i had had a meeting with the Substack guys like a year before covid and they were trying to convince me to leave the paper and start a newsletter and i thought you are insane i'm not gonna give up my fifty thousand dollar a year job i have insurance i get one week of one week a year off you are crazy um of course i, I should have done it then um and then maybe i'd have a successful newsletter by now as well um but it just seems you know it seemed like where else am i gonna get a job there's no other media job so i probably would have stayed there for a long time and just been increasingly miserable um so being forced out because of covid was fantastic for me i'm will always be for, uh, grateful to those um, lab techs in, in Wuhan. Yeah. <laughs> so I do want to ask you about the uh, queer community or the LGBT community in Seattle, um, because unlike me, you're somebody who was for a long time actually plugged into a lot of that scene. What was that like? And, and did they kind of start to turn on you? Did you lose friends in that community? Did you start to feel unwelcome in those spaces when you were speaking out? Because I have, I have a feeling that's the case, and it strikes me as funny because none of the like edgy opinions you've, you've actually described strike me as particularly non-liberal, right? They just strike me as like slightly against the grain of, of like the cutting edge of woke or whatever, but they, these aren't like right-wing takes, but did you nonetheless start to be isolated in the community? Yeah, uh, and I, so I, I moved to Seattle in 2015, so I'd only been there for a couple of years. So I, I hadn't built up really good, t I hadn't built up like a great big community in Seattle by the time I got sort of canceled. Um, but that didn't really matter. So yes, I was totally isolated and ostracized from Seattle, queer, the Seattle queer community from people that I knew. Um, weird things would happen, like I would meet people and they would find out who I was and they would uh, go from having a very nice conversation to all of a sudden being very hostile. So stuff like that would happen. But that, because I hadn't, you know, I didn't grow up in Seattle. I was sort of new to the community. That to me wasn't as, and I also like by that point I was in my, uh, let's see, I guess my mid late thirties for most of my adult life, I'd lived in North Carolina. And so it was there that I had really a, a lot closer ties and a lot bigger community. And so what was surprising to me was that my old friends, the people I'd been friends with for 10, in some cases, 15, almost 20 years, those people also, a lot of them um, kind of kicked me out, kind of were like, well, nobody ever, like 
very few people actually like contact like had the balls to contact me and be like you did something problematic you're no longer welcome at brunch most people just blocked me on social media and like never returned my text or calls again so that was a lot more um wait like, so you had was... friends that you've been friends with for years that one day you checked and you were blocked if this happened this still happens to this day this happens like once a month like what i'll like look at somebody dude and these are not even a lot of these are not even queer people these are people who just heard something heard something that probably isn't true assumed it was true and decided to like preemptively block me on facebook or whatever like i like so i don't know who this was but people were going around people who i probably have never met were going around to mutual friends to like my friends in san francisco or my friends in portland and telling them that they could no longer be friends with me and a lot of my friends listened to them that's psychotic but also yes. i don't know that they were ever real friends but that's the thing a lot of these people were you know these are people i lived with these were people i was very close to they just i think fully are fully like full believers or the social pressure to conform to this one narrative they, they think i'm a trump voter they think i'm a trump supporter and in some they think i'm racist because i didn't like put up a black square on my instagram page during blm and <sighs> there is so much pressure to conform within the queer community like que like queer people like to think that they are somehow alternative no they are not alternative they're just like every other click there's just there's a lot of pressure so i i get it but it was very disappointing to learn that like a lot of people that i invested years of my life and are just like kind of pussies that's probably the best way of saying it yeah, that's really sad. Maybe part of the reason I've avoided this problem is uh, is I basically never had any gay friends. Yeah, really I, I think, so I think like gay men, I think are a little bit different. I think gay men have a tendency to be more problematic and also probably don't give as much. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm like generalizing here. Probably depends on where you live. Lots of socioeconomic factors. Lots of various factors. I have found that it's like queer people. And I do think there's a difference between people who identify as queer and people who identify as Yeah, like I would not gay. use that word to describe myself. Yeah. And I was in like radical queer communities where like the idea, like defunding the police, that's a given. Letting everybody out of the prisons, like everybody believes that. Those were the sorts <laughs> of communities that I was in. Um, so it's not super surprising uh, that they also like think that I'm literal Hitler. Well, I want to. I do want to get into your actual views that are are so controversial. Because one of the things you often hear said is like Katie Herzog is a turf, which for folks that don't know is stands for trans exclusionary radical feminist. A couple of questions about that. One, I know some people consider turf like an insult or a slur. What are your thoughts on that? And two, are you a turf? Uh, I think it can be. People use it as a slur people use it in a denigrating way all the time i've been called that many times but some people also you know have decided to reclaim it and they use it they sort of proudly identify as turfs and i don't think they're calling themselves a slur so i think it, it depends on the context and in terms of my own beliefs i'm not a turf because at this point i don't identify as a radical feminist much less i don't identify as a feminist much less a radical feminist so i've gone through this sort of evolution where and part of that is realizing that I don't trust activists and I don't really care what the cause is. I don't trust activists because working in the media over the past 10 years, I have seen over and over again, activist groups mislead reporters in particular and the general public and not doing it out of a place of malice, doing it because they are true believers. And I think when your identity gets so wrapped up in a cause, it becomes really hard to evaluate that cause on its merits. So I no longer consider myself a feminist. That doesn't mean I don't hold many feminist values. It doesn't mean I don't d defy gender stereotypes. I do all of that. And obviously, I think that women should be entitled to every right that men have in the world. But I don't call myself a feminist anymore. So the idea that I'm a radical feminist is ridiculous. Also, I'm not a radical feminist because I think radical feminists tend to be a little bit more blank slate than I am. Like, in some ways, I am a little bit of a biological essentialist, which is sort of a dirty term. But I do think that that one's physical, uh, like the hormones in your body, I, I, I think that has a really significant determinative effect on behavior. 
Um, I think that males and females are fundamentally different in many ways. And I think that lots of radical feminists would argue that that's not true, that the only differences between outcomes in men and women is due to sexism and patriarchy. And I don't even really believe in the patriarchy, at least in the United States. I believe it in Saudi Arabia. It's real there. Um, so no, I would not consider myself that. But in terms of my beliefs, I mean, some of my beliefs do align with TERFs or gender critical feminist. Um, yeah, but not all of them. Do you have specific questions about yeah, because you, I, I see you as occupying somewhat of a middle lane on the trans stuff because you do support trans adults being able to do whatever they want. You do use preferred pronouns in some contexts, though, like me, you're not on the non-binary train, which we can get to later. Um, and so I wonder, because I do see some people in the, the self-identifying turf camp or really take a hard line uh, of absolute, they have, they seem to at this point have no tolerance whatsoever for, for trans adults, you know, especially trans women, I think, especially trans women, they will not use pronouns. They will not even use new names that have been legally changed. They think they that think Buck Angel should be forced to use the women's room, which doesn't make any sense to me. Yeah. And so I'm, I'm, I'm wondering like on the scale of, the that approach to you know obviously the opposite extreme which is there's nine hundred seven thousand genders and a cat can be non-binary or whatever where do you place yourself on that scale i'm like a five i'm in i'm in between those two camps um i don't think that uh i don't think you can physically change your biological sex i don't think that trans women are women um i'm 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 willing to engage in the fiction that they are women in some circumstances um, I'm also, I try to be polite to people. I think that misgendering people is a um, a political loser. And I understand why people do it and I respect people's rights to misgender. I would never argue that somebody should be kicked out of a, off any sort of platform or, for misgendering anybody. I think it, it really is a free speech issue. But I also think that um, for lots of reasons, I think that it's a, it's a dumb hill to die on. And one of those reasons is I, it, it's alienating to the trans people, to gender critical trans people, not all of them. Some of them are fine being uh, appropriately sexed or misgendered. But for some of them, people like Erica Anderson, who's a clinician in San Francisco, who's been very outspoken about her concerns about what's happening in youth gender medicine. Eric, if, if, if you are concerned about this issue, Erica Anderson is a fantastic ally to have. And a really good way to alienate her and to get her to shut up is to call her a man all of the time. I think there's a lot of cruelty in the uh, in the uh, turf space or whatever you want to call it. Um, there are lots of people who are genuine transphobes, both conservatives and and liberal women. Um, and I'm not. I'm really not. I do have trans people who are friends in my life. I do respect them. I do like them. I do think that gender dysphoria is a is a, a legitimate psychological condition and if if it is best treated by changing one's sex and you're an adult i'm fine with that i really don't care that doesn't mean that i think that trans women should be competing in women's sports i don't i think that is ridiculous i think the fact that this has ever anybody even entertains that idea is silly and i think for activists it is a losing position to take um yeah this it would have seemed like Trans women in, in sports would have seemed like such a fringe, fringe leftist position to take, blank slatist position to take five, six, seven years ago. And now it's something that is probably going to come up during the presidential campaign. I, I think, think, trans I think it still is low key a fringe in the actual public, but like in political discourse and media spaces, it is obviously normalized as a mainstream idea. Yeah. But I I think you'd still, I don't know the numbers off the top of my head. I still think you'd get even a majority of Democrats polled oh, yeah. would say no to trans women and women's sports. Even I, I think you're right about that. Yeah, this there might be some particular, uh, you know, some, some cohort like 18 to 24 or something like that might think that trans women and women's sports is fine. But I think for most of us, it is just a loser of an issue. Um, when it comes to, I don't think, I don't think children should that be able to change sex. I think it's crazy that <laughs> this is like something that activists are, are willing to, to, uh, to fight for. It just seems like such a, a common sense loser position. Um, so I think I probably am like mainstream Democrat when it comes to this. I don't think that parents should lose their children for socially or even medically transitioning them. 
Um, so I think that, you know, I think that right wingers and left wingers are have really uh, taken wildly extreme positions on this issue. And the what's best for everybody is somewhere in the middle. Yeah, I want to get into your views on youth gender medicine in particular, because that's one of the more controversial subjects that you've discussed and spoken about. Uh, and you're deeply skeptical, uh, like Jesse is, of, of this science that's cited to support youth gender transition in the medical sense. Um, but you guys seem to walk this line, at least I, that's my perception of you, between thinking it's generally, you know, probably not a good idea and not safe and effective and all the things that they say about it, but also seeming to oppose the laws banning or restricting medical transition heavily for minors. How do you thread that needle and why do you land where you land? Yeah. So where I come down to the come down on this is the more I have learned about this and I didn't I didn't realize how weak the evidence was in 2017 when I wrote my piece about the transitioners. It is becoming abundantly clear that the evidence that puberty blockers lead to better outcomes for youth or puberty blockers or medical transition lead to better outcomes for youth. The evidence is really weak. Um, and so as I've learned more, I've sort of shifted my thinking on this. Like now, I don't think that kids should get puberty blockers, especially from a young, the younger ages, because it impedes not just fertility, but it also impedes one's sexual development. So if a, if a kid starts taking puberty blockers at 11, 12 years old, that kid will probably, and then goes on to take cross-sex homers, that kid will probably never have an orgasm in his or her life. And I don't think kids can consent to something that they cannot physically conceptualize, uh, much less the fertility issue, which I also think just asking kids to make that decision at a young age is just, it's, it's, it's immoral. Um, but I think the way that Republicans have handled this issue has been really ham-fisted. And one of those reasons is, and I'm not just talking about things like banning puberty blockers, uh, which in some cases is going to send, you know, if you have if you have a kid whose parents are supportive, whose community is supportive, what that's going to do is that's going to cause a, a huge a huge schism with his family if their kid tries to, if their kid is, is basically forced to detransition. So it just, I think it causes a lot of heartache, even though I don't think parents should be doing it. I think the state imposing that on parents is... Uh, it's bad politics for one. So what happens is that there'll be this sort of equal and opposite reaction where a state like Texas or Tennessee or something will pass a law banning, uh, banning puberty blockers and then blue states will pass a law in response to that. So you'll see things like in Oregon, the age of consent will just get lower and lower and lower and then you have 13 year olds able to get puberty blockers without parental consent. And this to me is bad in both ways. Like we don't want politics to be just swinging from one extreme to the other, we want it be to, we want it to be based in actual in, in data and evidence. And I think the data is becoming more and more clear that things like puberty blockers are not beneficial uh, are not beneficial to children. But I also think that this guidance needs to come from medical associations, which yes, in the United States have been captured, and not the state. I don't think the state has any place imposing these values uh, on on people who, who might not not hold them i mean what's your thinking about about these laws well i think uh, i am supportive of the concept of laws that that yeah. uh, what i've always said is i think the age of consent for sex in a state if it's 16 or 17 or 18 should also be the age of consent to consent to these kinds of permanent medical transitions uh, in theory, I'm okay with the laws. I view them as an issue of consent um, and informed consent as well. In practice, a lot of these laws are terribly written, very poorly yeah. drafted, uh, and are kind of hyper-partisan in a way that I wouldn't want to sign on to them. And I, I'm not sure which way I would vote if I was a state legislator. But I've never viewed the, the political project as illegitimate in and of itself. Because maybe in part be because I would love to see the path that you're talking about happen with the medical institutions kind of changing their standards and practices of care and, you know, moving on as we've seen them do on other medical issues over the years, right? Changing, um, you know, the extreme example, but like lobotomies going out of fashion right. in the medical community, right? Not to say those are directly comparable, but I'm just saying that the medical community can evolve over time how it, it, it but on this issue, they seem so ideologically captured. When you have mm -hmm. every major medical institution 
uh, or organization in the country making statements that are manifestly untrue. I mean, I, I talked about this with my boyfriend. Uh, we get the journal Pediatrics sent to us because he's a pediatrician, which is um, it's done by, you know, the pediatrician's body or whatever. And Jesse talked about this maybe on the podcast, maybe in his newsletter, I don't remember, but they published an article in this prestigious, it's like the journal for pediatrics that they didn't even bother to check the sources because if they had, mm -hmm. they would have noticed that the hyperlinks linked to the wrong source. And so it made all these claims about youth gender medicine that aren't true. And that if you click through the sources, don't even say what the people say they were saying. And, you know, Jesse did a full debunking of it on his Substack, and they they clearly hadn't even edited the article in terms of fact checking at all because the hyperlinks went to the wrong website in multiple locations or to the wrong source. And mm -hmm. so that kind of thing to me, I'm like, this is the premier pediatric right. journal, peer reviewed. Right. And yeah. you're telling me that these institutions are going to see the light and, and change. It just strikes me as not a viable path for something that I, I do think needs to, needs to be stopped somehow. Yeah, I think one of the problems, though, is that they're also responding to politics, right? They're not just responding to the to the evidence. These organizations have absolutely been captured. That is abundantly clear. Um, the new the W the W path files shows that as shows that as well. This recently released project from Michael Schellenberger's uh, newsletter, but. I think that these a lot of these people feel as though they are fighting extermination, they are fighting bigotry, and in some cases they genuinely are. And so they are responding in part to these laws. So are they going to change their guidelines as long as Greg Abbott or Ron DeSantis are trying to dictate what bathrooms people can use or what uh, or what parents can and can't choose for their children? I don't think so. So I think these two things are happening in, in concert with each other, and they're just feeding off of each other with both sides becoming more in, in, intractable in their own beliefs. Um, but yes, I mean, my hope is that what's coming out of Europe will influence uh, some of these medical organizations. Probably won't. <laughs> <laughs> I don't That's know. That's what I want to happen. They will follow uh, the science. So I want to I want to ask you about something else that I hear a lot from kind of the liberal gender critical crowd are lesbians going extinct and what do they mean when they say that so i mean it's obviously that is a hyperbolic thing to say lesbians will there will always be softball teams we will always exist <laughs> um, but but what has changed is that it is deeply uncool to be considered to call yourself a lesbian and i think this is just a fad but what is cool is to be non-binary or a trans guy and so the circles that I used to be a part of, the number of, of people who would have called themselves queer women who were feminists or were feminists, proud dykes, uh, the number of individuals in those circles that have transitioned to male or done the non-binary thing, maybe they take hormones and get a double mastectomy. Oftentimes they don't, they just change their pronouns. A lot of people have gotten top surgery, double mastectomy, it's very end. And they should do some buy one, get ones at the local uh, plastic surgery. Uh, but so what's happened is that that it is hip and cool to be a trans guy. It is not hip and cool to be a boring old lesbian. So that is what has changed. I don't think I don't think people are engaging in less like same sex sex. If anything, I think they're doing it more as uh, as taboos have shifted. Um, but it's just uh, I think it is. At this point, it is a little bit, it's seen as a little bit sort of stodgy and old fashioned to consider oneself a lesbian, if not actually problematic, because it is problematic to be same sex attracted and not look at gender and not genitals or whatever. Yeah, I mean, I see this a lot on TikTok, and I have a hard time telling how much of an actual belief it is out there in the world outside of these internet bubbles. But like, yeah. I see a lot of content essentially suggesting that. Um, trans men can be lesbians and also non-binary people can be lesbians. Right. To me, right. that seems to be essentially deleting the concept of lesbian as a word. I yeah. can't really square that circle. I mean, how do you interpret that? Well, uh, trans men have been in lesbian circles for a long time. And there was always, they were always welcome in the circles that I, that I was in. And, but the, the difference 
is that there was an acknowledgement, a tacit acknowledgement that trans men, there's a difference between trans men and males. And so trans men were welcome in places where males would not have been, particularly cis males, you know, uh, lesbian bars, lesbian nights at clubs, lesbians beds, because we all knew, nobody ever said it, but we all knew that they're there was females. something different. About, yes, that they're female, that they are female. And so what has happened in recent years is that we're supposed to pretend that they're not female and that trans men are literal men and that there's no difference. And that if you were a person who is attracted to, like gay men should be interested in trans men because trans men are men, um, which is just does not align with my experience of sexual attraction. And I do think sexual attract, I mean, it, it is complicated because like there are some trans women, I'm a lesbian, there are some trans women that I would be more attracted to than a butch trans men because I'm not attracted to men. And so someone like Buck Angel is a female. I would not be attracted. Buck is a handsome man. Buck is a female. Buck to me is still a man, right? Does that make sense? I, yeah, I do think it is not, a little bit more complicated. Right. It is more complicated just, though, because sometimes I'll even, and it, I personally, you know, I'm in a long-term committed relationship like you, so it's a non-issue for me, but it, I wouldn't, I don't think I would be open to dating a trans man because there's some biological no. sex based yes. things about it that are determinative for me. However, you, it is more complicated than just like, what's your DNA say that will determine if I'm attracted to or not, because I've seen people come up in my feed and I'm like, Oh, that, that he's cute or whatever. And then I find out it's a trans man later. Yeah. I mean, like trans men can pass really well. I mean, yeah, you take a, take some testosterone and maybe some HGH and go to the gym every day. Yeah. So maybe just to round things out, uh, tell people a little bit about the Blocked and Reported podcast. I've been a, a huge fan of it for a while now. My boyfriend, will he, like, he tells me that my podcast is his favorite podcast, but I can see it in his eyes that he's lying and that Barpod is actually his favorite podcast. But what we've agreed now is that his favorite ep podcast episode ever is me on Barpod. So yes, that, that's his, finally his a detente. Why yeah. did you guys decide to do a podcast about internet bullshit? And did you ever expect it to be as popular and there to be so much interest in it as it ended up being? Um, we started this. So Jesse and I started talking about doing the show when I was still at The Stranger. And our idea was to do it. So The Stranger had already like had the infrastructure to do podcasts. I was on a podcast there called Blabbermouth. Dan Savage's show was hosted out of there. Um, and so the idea was like, we'll do a show together and we'll have the stranger produce it in that way. And I was just thinking like that way, I won't have to work on the weekends. Thank God that didn't happen. Uh, that would have been a disaster. Um, but yeah, I'm, you know, the, the origin of the show, I think was uh, just us like spending a lot of time talking or like in the DMs talking about what was going on in the culture around 2017, 2018, 2019, um, and being interested in the same like weird subcultures. And the trans stuff, obviously, we have a lot of overlap in our interests there. Um, and so it was sort of a natural partnership. And then, you know, I I, I sort of thought, I, I, I'm not totally surprised that it's become um, enough of a, like, hit to be my full-time job. I, I kind of thought that it would. Like, after COVID, I got a, a part-time job doing communications for, essentially, for, like, a very wealthy man who just needed some help. And uh, I quit that show, I think the week that we started the podcast, I was like, emailed him and I was like, I'm not going to need this anymore. I'm going to have a, I'm going to have a hit podcast. That's some confidence is, because Katie, so there's a lot yes. of podcasts out there and very few make enough money to have two full-time people support it. Yes. Yes. Well, we don't work full-time. That's the best part is that we work, we both work part-time. Um, so it is really the dream that way. Um, but I, I don't know why. I mean, it was. Also, the timing was really good. Like, I think if we started this show today, I don't think it would be a hit. I think we really got the timing exactly right. And there are better shows out there that are people spend put more effort on, uh, in, into that are more highly produced, that cost more money to produce, that have actual producers that aren't doing as well as our show. And I think so much of it has to do with timing. Um, you know, 2020 
was to be in this sort of, I, I don't like the term, but into this like heterodox environment, heterodox space when the, it's, it felt like the entire mainstream media was hammering this one or a couple of narratives about COVID and BLM and racism and sex and gender and trans shit and all these social justice issues. And at that time, to be one of the not that many outlets to be like, wait a second, let's like look at the data here. Are black men killed at disproportionately high rates than, uh, by police? You know, is that true? Is there a trans genocide? Is that true? To be some of the few people at that time who were doing that, um, put us just put us in this position where people were really hungry for the content. But now, four years later, there's a lot of people doing that. Um, and so I think, uh, yeah, I think we got incredibly lucky. All right. Well, I will put some links to Black Dirt Imported in the show notes for anybody who hasn't checked it out yet. They definitely should. But Katie, thanks so much for joining me today. And uh, we'll keep in touch and keep up the good stuff. Thanks, Brad. Good to talk to you. Hey, guys, Brad here. And if you want more Brad, if you're somehow not sick of me yet, make sure you check out the Based Politics podcast that I co-host with Hannah Cox. We just wrapped filming on a great episode out now. That's right. This week, we're talking about Ron DeSantis taking a major L in the courts, plus a new Bidenomics website, and AOC gets a spoonful of her own medicine. You can watch us on the Base Politics Podcast YouTube channel or listen to the podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to All right, everybody, that's it for this episode. If you're still here, you must have found something interesting or insightful about this conversation. So please do hit that like button or comment with your thoughts below if you're watching us on YouTube. And if you're listening to us on podcast, make sure you take a second and make sure you're subscribed and that you rate or review us on whatever platform you use. And with that, I'll talk to you all next week. But if you want more damage control, you can go here or here to check out other episodes that you might just like.